Well, that will easily take us an hour. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, we'll see if we can get through it quicker than that. Welcome to this episode of the Academy of Management Review Origin Series. My name is Rich McAdock, uh, and I'm your host, as well as being an associate editor for AMR and a professor of management at Purdue University's Cranach School of Management. Uh, my two guests for today are Howard Klein and Omar Solinger, uh, who, together with their co-author Veronique Duflo, uh, are authors of a forthcoming AMR article called Commitment System Theory, the Evolving Structure of Commitments to Multiple Targets. Gentlemen, welcome to the Origin Series. Thank you. Great to be here. Um, so give us a brief uh, elevator pitch for this paper. What's it about? Um, shall I take this, Howard, or? Um, sure, and then I'll add anything. I think that you know, we'll just play off each other. Yeah. Yeah, so we, we know that in our lives, we juggle multiple commitments. Uh -huh. So we are committed to our families, uh, to our work, to several projects in our work. We are committed to our careers, uh, to our values. So there's so many things at the same time that we're committed to that the question arises, how do we juggle all these things at the same time? Huh? So how do we keep all these balls in the air? Um, so an, a bit more analytical question is basically how do single commitments operate as part of larger systems? Right? So that was the question that we asked. And that's actually a new question in the literature because the literature has focused on, uh, let's say, single commitments. So a commitment to an organization or the commitment to a supervisor in leadership or commitment to a career in careers research. But very little was done actually to, to actually ask the question, we have multiple commitments, how does that work? And uh, so we, get, we got uh, to that question about, uh, I think, uh, what was it, Howard, five years ago? Uh, it was, uh, it's been a long process. Uh, our first answer is that commitments form systems. So why do they form systems at all? Eh? Why don't we just have individual commitments? Hmm. Okay, good question. Uh, that is because uh, it, it is more efficient to think about all of the commitments we have, for instance, in our home situation, to our wives, to our children, to the to sports that we do, to the churches we go to, whatever, right? So uh, that makes it more, more efficient, or the, or the projects. We have several projects. Commitments that belong to one project are different from commitments that belong to another project. So we form batches that each on their own make sense. Um, and uh, so we call them, so that the thing that are that those sets of commitments are based on, we call typifications. It can also be an, a role because it, commitments gain meaning by the meaning that we give to them. Yeah? Sometimes our commitments we have with teaching are based on our role of a teacher as a professors. So that is, that is one answer. Huh? So commitments form systems because we typify them in the same way. They are of the same type. And then the question is, if they are parts of systems, how do these systems look like? And, each, and those systems themselves are, are also dynamic. So they can grow with, if we add more commitments to them, or they mm -hmm. can shrink. Mine always them. do. <laughs> yes. <laughs> they never seem to shrink. Indeed. They, they only grow, don't they? Um, but sometimes they overlap. Uh, some you can find synergies between even competing sets of uh, subsystems or they can even merge or at some point uh, they can grow apart and start to conflict so that is one part of the paper and the other part of the paper is if commitments are parts of systems what does it matter uh, so and then we we ask the question if you for instance have a central commitment in a system that's a different it will behave dynamically to for instance to, to, to disruptions 
differently than peripheral uh, commitments. Or if you have a tight and coupled system, then you re respond to shocks in a different way than if, if your, those commitments are in a loose, loosely coupled uh, system. Um, so basically those were the, the three main chunks of the paper. And then of course we end with what does this all mean and why is this important and who should read this? Okay, great. So uh, let's take, let me just ask you to dig a little deeper into the paper and, and what it means. I'll share my screen so we can see your figure four where you kind of um, uh, um, summarize and, and gather together uh, all of the different ideas in the paper. Can you maybe talk us through this figure a little bit and what it means, what, the, all, what all the different parts mean? Yeah. How do you want to take over or shall I uh, do it? Um, so this figure kind of summarizes everything we've put forth in the paper, right? So we kind of walk through each of our propositions and how those propositions are related um, in the summary figure. Um, so one of the things we touch on is how those typifications lead to commitments um, merging together into a coherent system. Uh, so that's the first proposition is that if we tend to assign the same meaning to a group of commitments, those commitments are gonna group together. Um, a, a key issue with, you know, thinking about multiple commitments is we know that they're interrelated. Right. But in the previous literature, we have, didn't have a good sense of why or how, because the, one of the things we quickly realized when we started looking at this is any two commitments could be synergistically related, could be neutral, or could be in conflict. And the existing literature didn't provide any explanation for why that was or how, um, you could understand why the same two commitments say it's to supervisor and to organization or to mm -hmm. organization and union. And some studies were found to be positive related and other studies found to be negatively related. Right. So what we really um, were trying to develop was a, um, a theory perspective that would allow the explanation for those discrepant findings and allow us to predict um, you know, understanding depending on the situation and the person, why the same commitments may or may not be synergistic or conflicting. Uh, so that was maybe another piece of kind of the, the origins or the, the elevator speech to, uh, to this paper. So if, um, if commitments are given the same meaning, have to share the same typification, they're likely to uh, merge because those positive relationships among them merge into a coherent system Proposition one, uh, if they are conflicting different meanings um, and different meanings that cannot be easily balanced um, either by switching between them, but, but working towards one actually is at the detriment of another, right. uh, that's when they're gonna segregate into different systems. Um, so that's hypothesis, or proposition two. And we make the distinction there between whether they're behaviorally separable or not. And that's this notion of um, essentially commitments are synergistic when taking the same actions allow you to meet the needs of multiple commitments. So engaging the same behavior um, allows you to meet your commitment to your supervisor and to your team simultaneously. Uh, in other cases, your demands of your supervisor and your demands of your team might be incompatible. Uh, so that's where they're not behaviorally separable, where you actually have to choose between acting on one commitment to the detriment of another commitment. Um, so when they're not given the same typification and they're not behaviorally separable, that's when you're gonna have that negative interrelationship, dynamic interrelationship between commitment become negatively uh, coupled um, where they do um, are behaviorally separable, that's where you can kind of manage both by switching roles back and forth, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's where this, they become decoupled uh, with different uh, typifications. Um, I got anything, I got that right, Omar? <laughs> that's over here. Okay, I see. Yeah. 
I, I was getting a little ahead of you in my uh, no problem on the on the figure, but okay, that's over here. Right. Yep. Um, you also have situations where you have two separate systems that um, start to converge uh, because of that uh, multiplicity and intersect, where you have some commitments that appear uh, kind of overlap. Uh, the boundaries of the two separate commitment systems actually share uh, a commitment and, and career commitment is one we talk about in the, in the uh, example uh, in the paper as an example of that where your commitment to your career can actually be given different interpreted differently and allow and, and that multiplicity of meanings um, multiple typifications allows it to be that uh, intersecting uh, bridging commitment between two systems mm -hmm. um, let's then jump over to the other side to proposition four and, and how commitment systems operate there we make the distinction between whether or not a system has um, a strong central element um, and by that we mean that there's a, a really strongly held commitment at the center of that system or near the center of that system, it's very self-central to that person. And when that's the case, you have a very centralized um, system and the commitments in that system are kind of all driven by and, and kind of um, orbit around that central commitment. In other cases, you don't have that strong central commitment um, and the commitments within that system are then um more loosely coupled to each other they're not all kind of connected by that strong central force so that brings in system uh, concepts of compactness and central um, and centralization and those things matter because when there is a disruption when there's a change in the environment or something happens to the person uh, those systems are going to react differently if there's that strong central commitment or if the system is very compact. And by compact, we mean that all of the commitments are very tightly coupled, very highly uh, interrelated versus only loosely interrelated. Mm -hmm. um, and on the other side, um, if a system is, um, kind of, if you have these intersecting systems, that also affects how it might uh, respond to changes in the environment. Um, they could break back apart or they could further merge together um, depending on um, how the person's typifications of those commitments change based on what is going on in their lives or in the environment. So I think wow. at a very high level that kind of summarizes the figure. Okay, well, so there's a lot going on there, a lot of different moving yeah. parts in this, in this framework. Um, who, who would benefit most from, from reading this paper? Who's the target audience for this paper? Who should read it? So I think anyone interested in understanding individuals or teams and their behavior in organizations would have an interest in it because commitments, one of the really interesting thing is about commitments and why they've been studied so frequently is they're so central to understanding people's um, motivation uh, how workers choose to direct their efforts and how much effort they give. So I think anyone interested in predicting behavior of individuals or teams would have an interest in reading this. Uh, I think it's also relevant for more macro researchers because commitments can provide the micro foundations for topics that are of interest to them. That makes sense, that makes sense. So uh, we, you know, we do call this the AMR origin series uh, because we are interested in the origins of the projects. You know, with the, 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 the subtitle of the series is where does theory come from? Right. Uh, and we do this as a service to, uh, to researchers who, you know, who may never have contemplated writing a theory paper and don't know how to start. Uh, and so we like to, you know, provide them with some at least some exam example examples or exemplars sure. of how others have have done it, how the path that others have walked towards uh, creating a, a theoretical contribution. So, so how did this project get started for you? Yeah, it actually dates back to 2014, uh, where Omar and I had lunch together at the end of the 2014 conference on commitment, which is something I organize and host here at Ohio State. 
And our initial interest was in trying to better understand the relationships among all the different commitments that people have and are being studied. You know, as, as Omar mentioned, commitment to organization, to goals, to unions, to teams, to career, and trying to develop a good organizing framework for thinking about those different commitment uh, targets, the different things at work to which people can be committed. Um, and what we quickly realized is that it, there's no simple way to create that typology or framework, because as I said, any two commitments might be synergistic, neutral, or conflicting, depending on the person or situation. So that's what kind of uh, launched our quest to try and develop um, a, a theory that would help us better understand that. So we began working on that, and um, it was kind of back and forth for a couple of years, and then we were presenting our ideas at another um, conference, an incubator commitment conference, um, where we had used kind of the solar system as just an analogy mm -hmm. to how different commitments can influence each other, and that you know you can't understand the orbit of the Earth without taking into account the gravitational pull of the other planets. Mm -hmm. And in the audience was our third author, Veronique, who happened to have a PhD in physics, in addition ah. to having a career change and now studying organizational behavior. And, and she pointed out that we, we could do more than just treat uh, that physics as, a, as an example. We could actually use established theory and, and, and techniques in physics to model commitments and how they interact. So that's, I think, what really launched the paper towards its current uh, configuration. Um, Omar, anything to, to add to that background? Yeah, yeah. And uh, of course, we started with a more cursory ideas of, you know, commitment salience and maybe uh, changes in environment and the person. So what makes one commitment eh? and what makes one want to juggle two separate commitments? But at some point, uh, I had a talk also with uh, a, a colleague and say, he says, he said, I generally base my commitments on a central idea. And then it, that was really an aha. Mm. And, that, and that started with me with a, that started us on this whole thinking trajectory of maybe there is some kind of a gravitational system that, you know, commitments are pulled toward each other. And maybe there are even multiple planetary systems in our lives, so to speak, mm -hmm. multiple subsystems. And this was basically then the logic that we took to the conference. And there we, we met Veronique, who, uh, who was able with all of her toolkit to, uh, to really give this, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, some extra co conceptual tools. And of course, then we had to integrate all of the knowledge that comes from physics, which is great, with our intuitions and theorizing and imagination of how commitment systems might work. Um, so then we get into the whole write-up process and um, here is our first paper that we send in and we're all very happy and super excited that we merged physics with uh, the study of commitments. And then the reaction of the reviewers was, uh, yeah, we like the idea that we need to study multiple commitments, but we don't like physics. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that was that was the core of the idea. Um, mm -hmm. It was a bit too far off. And I can remember a, a paper of Ockhuizen and Bonardi in 2011 that this is actually a very common comment. If you try to bridge multiple uh, lenses that are far away from each other, uh, so different assumptions and basically different phenomena, you try yeah. to relate them to one another. The question is always why? Why this? Why not something closer? Mm. Uh, yeah. And uh, so this was the our um, way of thinking about this is we still think that the physics makes sense because it is a great toolkit. But what we need, of course, is a, an overarching framework that helps us explain why we need physics. And that was the general system theory, because system commitments are part of larger systems. Right. right. And, and the principles that we were borrowing, that we were taking from physics, are consistent with the same principles in general systems theory. Sure. I think part of the issue was the reviewers were, were a little bit, you know, uh, aghast that they're not going to have to learn physics in order to study commitments. <laughs> it's understandable. We weren't the... Uh, 
too keen on that ourselves. But mm -hmm. uh, so that we came to the realization that we could essentially still make the same arguments, but couch it in terms of general systems rather than physics. And general systems is already in the management uh, literature, so it was much less of a uh, a leap for readers and reviewers to have to shorter walk. Yeah, yeah. You didn't, you didn't have to cross the whole solar system to get there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I, you know, as you were describing this, I was thinking it's it is so interesting how our theories can change according to the metaphors that we we have in mind. You know, you you mentioned the you were using the the metaphor of gravity, but you know, if you had shifted it only slightly to use uh, the metaphor of electromagnetic forces, you would have had to think about both attraction and repulsion, right? Uh, where where things could not only pull to Pull, pull together, but push apart. So I actually had that in an earlier version. Yes. Okay, so <laughs> that's the, 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 um, the conflict they're pushing apart and when they're um, in synergy, they're pulling to, towards each other. <laughs> there, there are a lot of things that were in earlier versions that didn't make it in the final version. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously that, that always <laughs> happens on, on theory papers. Um, so, okay, so what, what made this project interesting enough for you to want to devote your time and effort and attention to it? Yeah, for me, of course, it, is, it was the, yeah, it was kind of the adventure of the quest that you ask yourself a question that even though there's been decades of research on commitment, this question of how do we juggle multiple commitments at the same time was actually never really asked. Mm. And that combined with the thrill of trying to combine this somehow with an idea of physics and gravity would really make this for me into an exciting yeah, intellectual challenge. Um, but, of, but of course, uh, yeah, that was the main excitement, but then the actual write-up and the review process where actually people said, uh, nice idea, but we don't like physics. Uh, uh, reinvent the paper again those yeah those experiences kind of challenged that in that, that initial excitement but we but we kept uh, many of the initial ideas actually until the end in the paper yeah, yeah i think for me it's, it's very much the same right so it was the fact that you know it's been realized since the 50s that people have multiple commi multiple commitments mm -hmm. it's something you talk to anybody and they can easily relate to it in terms of the challenges of all the commitments they have in juggling them. Uh, and yet we didn't have a good answer in, in the literature. So that, that challenge of solving this problem that's been around for, for a long time, but not really uh, successfully addressed was, was part of that. And I think for me, another part of it was the, you know, the opportunity to work with Omar, who, um, whose work I've uh, admired, but we haven't written anything together before, collaborated before this. Uh, and then Veronique and bringing in that completely different literature, right? So we had uh, researchers in three different countries, three different na native languages and three different mm. uh, perspectives um, and trying to merge all those um, was both you know, at times challenging, but also really rewarding uh, to see it all come together. Um, and I always like projects where I learn new things and I learned a lot working on this project, both about uh, physics and systems theories, as well as uh, commitments. Interesting. So you mentioned you mentioned the two challenges so far. One was the, the the challenge provided by the reviewers when they didn't like your metaphor, uh, and the other was the challenge of you know working at a distance with um, well, I guess not just physical distance, but perhaps cultural and linguistic difference uh, distance um, with, uh, in your in your co-author team. And disciplinary differences and disciplinary <laughs> di distance, right? So disciplinary linguistic physical, cultural distances within, within the co-author team. Um, were there any other challenges that you faced in, in doing the project that are worth mentioning? You know, I think the, the biggest theme through the revision process was going to more depth on fewer issues. Right? So mm. I think our, our first several submissions, the reviewers felt there was too much breath and not enough depth uh, mm -hmm. that we weren't fully explaining um, anything because we were trying to cover so much. Um, 
So I think that was another challenge in terms of what to cut and what to leave in and, and how to balance that depth and breadth um, when introducing a very new perspective to think about a very established concept. Yeah, so how did you make those choices? What, what, uh, cause I, I know I, I face those choices in my own project. So, you know, okay, there's, you know, there's six things I'm trying to say here and, uh, you know, I got to cut it down to four, which, which of my, which of the two things that I care, you know, which, which of these six things that I care about do I, am I willing to, to put aside for this paper and maybe come back to in other papers or whatever? Right. How, do you, how do you make those decisions? Well, one of the ways to make those decisions is what, which of the elements speak the most, right? And also speak the most to your specific construct. Because one of the other uh, challenges was, of course, uh, systems are general and they apply to any system. But why does this apply to commitment? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And this was one of the challenges that one of the reviewers, many of the re reviewers had. And so we could, for instance, show with uh, the, the centrality and the compactness that we could explain uh, things or contradictory findings in the commitment literature that you would otherwise have no explanation for. So, uh, okay. Okay, so you were you were you were cutting out things that had less impact and focusing on things that had more impact, right? These yeah. these were parts of the theory that were impactful because they could explain hitherto unexplained results. Yeah. That makes sense. So I, think so I could see I could see other ways of 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 trimming, right? You could you know e even even from your own theory, right? I is it central or is it not central, right? Mm -hmm. You could you could go that way. Is it uh, uh, I think that could play a big role in terms of what things are absolutely necessary or the other things we want to talk about won't make any sense. <laughs> so I, I think that's right. the centrality issue. Um, so I think it was, it was that what's kind of core, if we don't talk about none of this makes sense versus and, and what, what are the, what's the value added to commitment in terms of resolving uh, discrepancies in the literature or inconsistency findings. Um, I think those were our two primary um, factors. And then it, we did get some direction from the reviewers and the editor in terms of what they liked and didn't like. Right, right. So that factored in well. And, and in some cases, we disagreed with that, saying, no, this is central. We got to keep it. We just need to explain it better. In other cases, it's like, yeah, you're right. I guess that can wait for another paper. Right. Yeah. And, and it is, in some sense, an application of your own theory, right? Because you have Mm -hmm. Obviously, if you've got eight different parts to your paper, you have to make a decision about which ones you're committed to mm -hmm. and uh, which ones you're willing to, as you put it, segregate off into a different subsystem that we call a, a subsequent publication later. Right? Yes. So interesting, interesting how it, uh, it, uh, it is uh, self-referential in that way. So, um, okay. So let me close it out with a question about impact um, and actually, you know, I usually ask this question about what do you what do you hope the impact of the paper will be? I usually ask it in five different parts because it seems to me like there's five, at least five potential impacts that an AMR paper could have. It could have a, uh, an influence on future theory. It could have an influence on future empirical research. It could have an influence on future practice. It could have an influence on future pedagogy. Or in some cases, it could even have an influence on future policy. So just throwing out those five possibilities for you, you know, what, what, what impact do you think that, do you hope this paper will have in any of those five areas? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I think scientifically, of course, we hope that people in, within OB studying uh, the behavior um, will find this interesting and actually because the studying commitments as systems is actually a new territory in and of itself. So if, if this will spin out into a whole new territory of research in uh, commitment, that is a kind of an impact that we hope for. But even beyond the, the specific literature of commitment, there's also many different, uh, yeah, other commitment, uh, no, other constructs that also uh, have multiplicities so identities we have different goals uh, we, and so there's so many different things that can actually be applied uh, 
with the same kind of technique. And then even beyond OB, I would hope that macro researchers would find this interesting. Yeah? So mm -hmm. uh, I have been reading, for instance, uh, the book by Richard Scott about institutions, right? And, mm -hmm. and uh, the word commitment is used almost on every other page. Mm -hmm. Because institutions are based on, uh, on the commitments of those who produce them. And um, so many of the times, hopefully, um, commitments can, uh, well, fuel that uh, type of research as well. For instance, in when people talk about different institutional logics, we have used that part of the literature, for instance, to, to say, why do commitments segregate uh, into conflicting sets of commitments? Well, that, that's because sometimes there is a conflict between, for instance, um, the, our will to be green versus our, our, our will to be efficient or to be inclusive organizations. Yeah. So those contradictions can exist, but when leaders find some kind of an inclusive frame that makes uh, yeah, our commitments less conflicting, then this is actually something that can help us be, uh, share our uh, goals more and uh, produce and cooperate together yeah, in a way that is uh, yeah, more synergistic. Okay. Yeah. To to add to that, again, I think and my hope is is that it really change the trajectory of commitment research and then spill over to other areas of research. Um, you know, there there were a lot of things like I said that we took out of the paper um, that could be further explored, both theoretically and and empirically. Um, how do systems form? How do um, individuals prioritize? Um, you know, exploring in more detail how systems react to different environmental changes as a few examples. Uh, I think another key takeaway from the paper is that studying any single commitment in isolation isn't going to allow you to really understand the effects of that commitment because you're ignoring its interrelationship with the other commitments the person holds. And yet the bulk of the existing commitment literature has focused on just one commitment or a couple of commitments, but in, in, not, in not a um, kind of a one-off manner. Um, so I really uh, hope it kind of is, is a, a wake up call to, we need to think about just, you know, commitments as wholes or sets rather than uh, individually. Mm -hmm. Related to that is, again, this notion that in the past, the different commitments to different things have tended to be studied in isolation and in different silos, right? Um, motivation researchers studying goal commitment, career researchers studying career commitment, leadership researchers studying commitment to leaders. Um, so I think by taking a systems approach, uh, hopefully it also allows better integration across those literatures and the more efficient accumulation of understanding about how commitments operate. Interesting. So, so okay. So I've got so many questions now <laughs> that, that, that your answers have have have, uh, have put in my head. Like, you know, let me just start with some something really basic. Like, okay, so you've got eight propositions in this paper, right? So conceivably, that's at least eight empirical studies that could be done, right? Mm -hmm. So give some guidance to future empirical researchers who. You know, if they pick up this paper and say, "Hey, I'd like, I'd really like to test some of these propositions as hypotheses," what what kind of data would they be looking for? What kind of context would they need? What what kind of measures would they would they be wanting to uh, to to gather? Um, yeah. Give them some guidance here. Yeah. So the idea is that you would measure not just one commitment, but commitment to so several commitments that are relevant in a particular context. Uh, so if you work in a project, then you would have commitment to uh, quality, uh, to, to, to time, to, to deadlines, to, to colleagues, and to, and so the commitments that are relevant in a, in a particular work context, you will want to measure. And then you would pr probably need um, maybe a device on your smartphone where you can, over time, several times, measure these, and then also model them as a network, as, as commitments that have also relationships with one another. 
I would think you might want to, you know, you might want to look at a, an empirical setting where there are just naturally multiple commitments as a result of the nature of the job, like in a matrix organization, right? In a matrix organization where you're reporting to multiple bosses, right? Mm -hmm. You obviously have, you know, um, uh, well, you definitely have multiple commitments. You may have conflicting commitments, right? I'm reminded of the, the extreme example of this from the movie Office Space, where uh, Peter, the central character, had had seven bosses that he reported to. Wow. Joke there. Um, but, you know, maybe something like that where, you know, where it would, it's it's pretty clear that the person definitely has multiple commitments they need to deal yeah. with. I, and I'd make the case that, you know, I challenge you to, to give me a work context where people don't have multiple commitments. Right, right. But I guess I'm thinking you have multiple of goals, you have multiple those commitments. But yeah, so, so if your interest is, and part of it maybe whether you're interested is in particularly in, in goal conflict or commitment conflicts and how people resolve those conflicts, then, then something like that, you're right, you want to make sure you pick a, a context where you're, you're likely to have a lot of those mixed uh, priorities. Um, whereas in, in you know, any given workplace, you may or may not have more conflicting and more synergistic um, commitments. But I think you're always gonna have uh, plenty of commitments to, to look at. And I think one of the challenges would be where do you draw the lines? Uh, uh, and some piloting may be needed to, to get a sense of what are the relevant commitments in a particular context so you don't leave any key ones out. Right. So that's that's interesting. And, and it, it also kind of brings up in my mind uh, the, the, the practical implications of the paper, right? So if you're a manager yep. uh, who has to deal with multiple conflicting, well, multiple commitments may be conflicting, maybe not conflicting, but it, like if you're a manager in a, in a matrix organization, right? So what, what advice, what um, practical guidance, let me put it that way, what practical guidance could a manager gain from, from, you know, from uh, the, the framework that you've, you've developed here? Yeah, so I think what, you know, a key challenge for any manager is making sure that you know, a worker's priorities are aligned with the organization's priorities, right? So, and I think commitments are a way to help facilitate that in terms of, um, you know, um, providing communications, providing uh, resources, um, to ensure that people are typifying, you know, their their work commitments in a way that's going to minimize conflicts and and to help them see how maybe things are more related than they might see them to be. Um, so we do, we do have some, um, there's clear implications for practice from taking this approach. I'm not sure our knowledge base is at the point yet to provide definitive uh, uh, prescription, but I, but I think taking this perspective will hopefully allow for that knowledge base to develop where we can be much more definitively, um, more definitive in making prescriptions for managers. Right. So the other thing, I, I mean, I mentioned earlier about the potential impact on future policy. And, you know, it does occur to me that a lot of public policies are intended to influence individual behaviors, whether those are things like saving for retirement, uh, making good health choices, um, you know, those kinds of things. Um, and I'm reminded of uh, the book uh, by uh, Richard Thaler and Cass Sunstein from, uh, from about 12 years ago called Nudge where they talk about these, um, uh, these um, uh, policies, right? Uh, and in the, 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 the subtitle of the book, it's Nudge Improving Decisions About Health, Wealth, and Happiness, right? So, you know, am I, am I more committed to my health, my wealth, or my happiness, right? I, I would, it would seem like, you know, maybe you guys could have something beneficial to say to the public policy discourse in the sense that, you know, these, in, these, these policies may be focusing on individual commitment piece, you know, parts mm -hmm. of the commitment system, right? So, so maybe one reason why a, a policy uh, does not achieve its, its intended objective is that there's multiple commitments, right? Because I mean, even the word nudge implies that we're trying to get someone 
away from a particular commitment. We're trying to overcome a commitment, right? So maybe part of the challenge in trying to get someone to overcome one commitment is that it would conflict with some other commitment, right? So it just seems to me like maybe maybe the, the public policy discourse uh, may have this fragmented where they're looking at one commitment at a time, and maybe they would benefit by looking at the broader cluster or constellation or, or system of commitments uh, in terms of framing and 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 uh, and designing their policy interventions. What do you think? Yeah, yeah, I think definitely framing can help to. Uh... Yeah, to circumvent our conflicting commitments. I'm I'm thinking, for instance, of a of a situation where uh, our green commitments easily conflict with our corporate commitments for efficiency and making money. But there is a great example of a leader. Uh, it, it, it was the leader of Interface who said, you know, actually they can combine. And so as if a leader can find a frame that um, synthesizes them, for instance, he said. Actually, by not uh, polluting and by uh, not wasting so much, we actually also save costs. So it is not necessarily uh, that, the, that the two things bite each other. So leaders can really help to provide a frame, or let's say a, a common ground, where commitments that would otherwise conflict now get a new meaning. So, to be, so be green in order to save costs. Uh, and then, the, you know, what, what, what you would see is then the conflicting commitments start to merge in, in, uh, into one system where all those commitments that were previously uh, yeah, negatively coupled now are suddenly synergistic. And this is also, uh, yeah, the, the, yeah, the creativity of a particular leader finding, finding ways to, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. To combine previously, uh, yeah, negatively coupled elements. Yeah, I think maybe a, a second way that that our work can help is in terms of um, making uh, one a certain commitment system more salient than another system. Mm -hmm. So, so we we talk up in the paper about how our commitments kind of generally fall into these different subsystems, um, but we're not acting on all of our commitments at once. Um, and some systems operate kind of subconsciously and others are brought to consciousness depending on what's going on and, and what's salient at a particular point in time. So in addition to kind of framing and providing um, typifications that can help merge potentially conflicting commitments together, uh, another way for policymakers to maybe nudge uh, behavior is by making you know, a certain system more salient uh, than another system. Right, so here's just, just to show, here's the, the, the book I was referring to earlier. You know, so just encourage you guys to think about you know, what a revised version of this book might look like if it took into account the, the multiplicity of, 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 uh, of commitments that people, that, that you're trying to nudge people uh, about, right? Uh, and uh, and how that uh, that multiplicity of commitments could uh, 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 could alter the kinds of interventions that are used. Anyway, okay, well that's all the questions I've got. Uh, thank you very much for uh, sitting for a delightful interview. Really learned a lot from uh, from reading the paper and from uh, and from discussing it with you. And it's an excellent paper forthcoming in AMR and strongly recommend it to the audience uh, for this video. Uh, get out there and read it. Thank you. Thank you.